Hello, welcome back everyone. This is dry ice. Its temperature is negative 78.5 degrees Celsius and it's frozen carbon dioxide. This over here is water ice, frozen H2O. It's at zero degrees Celsius. Now when water ice melts, it turns into a liquid and then if we heat it further, it turns from a liquid to a gas. Three phases of matter for solid ice. For carbon dioxide or dry ice, when it melts, actually it turns directly from a solid into a vapor. We call that sublimation. Today I'd like to understand a little bit more exactly why carbon dioxide sublimates, turns directly into gas, whereas water ice goes through the liquid phase. So first let's start out by taking water ice and dry ice side by side and see how they differ when they change phase. Here we are at the six minute mark. We can see that for the water ice, we're already starting to get some liquid pool in the bottom, whereas the dry ice, there's absolutely no liquid at all. Here we are at 48 minutes. The ice is almost completely melted. The carbon dioxide dry ice looks like it's formed a crust of water condensation that has frozen on the surface. That's not coming from the material itself. That's coming from the air and freezing on the surface. Let me see if I can blow that away. And there it goes. There's the dry ice underneath, almost completely gone. So it took about 56 minutes for these two samples. The ice has turned almost completely into water with a tiny little chunk left behind and the dry ice is completely gone. So now we want to turn our attention to trying to understand exactly why does water go from solid to liquid and then to gas, but carbon dioxide at atmospheric pressure goes directly from solid to gas. What is the difference between these two molecules that causes that to happen? Well, Here's what we call a phase diagram. We have one phase diagram that describes water, and we have another phase diagram that describes carbon dioxide. I also have the molecules here to show you the difference. So on this axis is the pressure, and on this axis is the temperature. One thing for you to realize is that the everyday behavior that you experience with water is always at one atmosphere of pressure unless you're living in the mountains. So everything that you know about water is only at one atmosphere of pressure. Now on this chart, this uh, graph, the y-axis is in bar, and 1.01 bar is one atmosphere. So this dotted line is everything you've ever seen about water. So when water is below uh, this temperature of zero Celsius, notice this is 0.01, so this is zero Celsius, water is what we call ice. But once we warm it up past zero Celsius, it enters the water phase the liquid water phase. And once we uh, increase it past 100 Celsius along this line, it's in the vapor phase. So solid liquid gas is what you see every day of your life dealing with water at one atmosphere. All right, now if we increase the pressure, then what we do is we slide up this scale uh, to higher and higher pressures, but we have to read it left to right. So what it would mean is you would still have a solid phase and then a liquid phase and then a gas phase even at higher pressures. But notice that the water phase is much, much bigger. In other words, whereas down here at atmospheric pressure, the water phase goes from this point to this point, about 100 degrees Celsius, exactly 100 degrees Celsius, but here the water phase is much, much wider in terms of temperature. Why is that? Because you have to understand what what boiling is and what melting is. Basically, boiling and melting is fighting against atmospheric pressure. When we boil water, we give energy to the water molecules and they start moving faster and faster. Here are my, my water molecules. They're crashing into each other, moving faster and faster and faster. If they gain enough energy, then they escape and we say it boils and goes into vapor. But whenever it escapes, it's always being pushed against by the outside air pressure. So if the outside air pressure is really, really high, then it's much harder for the water to escape. And so at high pressures up here, then the water stays liquid for a long, long time. It, we have to put a lot of energy, hundreds of degrees in, to get water to boil at high pressure because it's pushing against that outside pressure. Whereas if we lower the pressure, 
down to say here, less than one atmosphere, this is an atmosphere, so down lower than that, then our water phase is much smaller. In other words, it begins to boil at a lower temperature right here. Why is that? Because when you go in the mountains, when the air pressure is less, then you're adding energy to the water and then it's just fighting against less of an external pressure, so it doesn't take as much heat energy in order to get the water to boil. That's why things boil easier on the top of a mountain. That's why the uh, boiling directions is different for food at the top of a mountain. All right, so we have the solid, we have the liquid, and we have the gas phase for water. Now notice, though, that if you lower the pressure down, 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 eventually you get to a point where there is no more water phase anymore down uh, very, very close to, to an absolute vacuum. You would still have the solid phase, but instead of transitioning to liquid, you would just go straight to the gas phase. This would be sublimation of water. We never see it because the pressure is just not low enough here. And the reason why it would happen is if the, if the atmospheric pressure is so low for water that whenever a, 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 a molecule of water in ice gets just enough energy, it won't even stay in the liquid phase. It'll just fly away and just escape as a gas. So that's down here. So the solid liquid gas that we take for so much for granted for water is the three phases of matter. It's really only because water behaves very nicely at atmospheric pressure. All right, now let's go over here and talk about carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a little bit different, right? The lines are different, the shading is different, and so on. But we can still look at one atmosphere, which is what we were doing our experiments at right here. Notice that they have solid carbon dioxide here, but there is no liquid phase. It just goes straight to the gas phase. This is sublimation. This is what we were noticing, different than the water ice that we had. We, that's what we want to explain. Why does this happen? And atmospheric pressure goes straight to gas. But notice if we increase the pressure up past five atmospheres, maybe six, seven atmospheres somewhere up here, then we would still have solid carbon dioxide, but once it reached its melting point, it would no, it would no longer go to a gas, it would go to carbon dioxide liquid. And then if you continue heating it up, it'll go to carbon dioxide gas. So you'd have solid, liquid, gas, carbon dioxide, three phases of matter. Do It does exist for carbon dioxide, but at a much higher pressure. So the things that we take for granted, solid, liquid, gas being the three phases of matter, it's really only relevant because we happen to live on a planet at this pressure. But on a planet with much, much higher uh, air pressure here, then we would have three phases of carbon dioxide and we wouldn't think it was weird at all. Right? So carbon dioxide behaves differently. That is what we've noticed. That's what we can explain with these diagrams here. But why does it behave differently? What is different about the water molecule that is different than the carbon dioxide molecule? That's what we want to answer next. So this is your friendly neighborhood water molecule. This is what we have in this diagram here. The uh, chemical formula for water is H2O. We have two hydrogen atoms. These are the white ones. We have one oxygen atom uh, in the middle, H2O. But notice it is a bent molecule. You learn why it's bent when you take chemistry, but it basically is because there's extra electrons that aren't in this model up here, which push the oxygens or the uh, hydrogens down at an angle. But it is a bent molecule that is different than carbon dioxide. I will show you in just a second. So that's reason number one that it's different. Reason number two is that oxygen, this one here, is what we call a very electronegative atom. It shares electrons. These black sticks here are sharing of electrons electrons with the, the hydrogens. There's electron sharing going on here. That's called a covalent bond. But the oxygen is so good at attracting electrons because of the way its nucleus and its electrons are configured that the electron sharing is not equal. So they are sharing it. That's what the black stick is showing us. But the oxygen is able to pull the electron cloud a little bit closer to the oxygen right here, and a little bit closer to the oxygen on this side. And that means that this hydrogen is very slightly positively charged. And this oxygen atom is very slightly negative charged. Now let me show you with some stickers what I mean. All right, so here are my water molecules again, but I've put stickers on there. I have a negative sign here, a positive sign here, and a positive sign here. Now overall, the atom is overall a neutral a neutral atom because it's sharing electrons here and it's sharing electrons here. The total number of electrons 
in the entire molecule, and the total number of protons in the molecule are equal. And so because of that, the whole thing from a distance looks like it's a neutral water molecule. But if you zoom in tight, you can see that the oxygen has a little more of a negative charge because this electron pair is pulled a little bit closer. And this electron pair is pulled a little bit closer. So really it's like it's got a little double the extra electrons kind of like from the sharing point of view, a little bit from this side, a little bit from this side. And the hydrogens are a little bit bare because their electron that it's sharing is being pulled a little bit that way. So it's a little bit positive here and here. Now every water, water molecule is like that. So here's a, another one and you can see that its hydrogens are also positive and its oxygens are also a little bit negative. Now what happens is in the solid phase, in the ice phase, these things are locked into a lattice. Actually you can see the positive here of this hydrogen and the, and the negative of this uh, oxygen are attracted together. And so if you look at the lattice of ice, the uh, positive and negative has a very strong uh, electric attraction, and so it's locked into a lattice of ice. But when you add a little bit of energy, they begin jiggling more and more and more, and eventually it can kind of break away and enter what we call the liquid phase. Now in the liquid phase, the two molecules can slide past each other. That's what we're all taught in school. But these hydrogens are all slightly positive, and that means that if these two hydrogens get close to each other, they're going to kind of bounce apart. But if this hydrogen becomes close to this oxygen, it's going to be very slightly attracted. In fact, the attraction can be enough to cause it to stick momentarily until thermal agitation bounces it away. Remember, everything is roiling and bouncing off each other in a liquid all the time. But on average, these hydrogens will, because this oxygen is exposed in the bent state like it is, they can kind of come close to each other and stick very ever so slightly. And that means that when we uh, boil, when we heat up water, they begin to move faster and faster, but because this uh, electrostatic attraction is happening, you have to add enough energy to overcome the attraction that's going on here to exit the liquid phase. So the liquid phase is when they're going past each other, but they're ever so slightly attracted to one another. That's because what we say about water is it's a polar molecule. Half of it is negative uh, down here, and half of it is positive, and because it's bent, these can come into contact and attract each other. But if we add enough energy to the water, eventually they get bouncing enough so that they overcome this intermolecular attraction and then they bounce away as vapor and we say it's a gas. So solid liquid gas, because it's a bent molecule and because part of the molecule is positive, part of it is negative, there's a distinct intermediate phase we call liquid where there's some intermolecular attraction that has to be overcome, which is what we call boiling. Now in order to actually boil, it has to overcome the pressure externally of the atmosphere. So we have to add enough energy to overcome this bond here and exit and overcome the pressure of the external atmosphere. Now let's compare this to what's going on in carbon dioxide. Now this is a carbon dioxide molecule. The black is the carbon, here is an oxygen, here is an oxygen. Now first of all, you can tell right away that one main difference between the two is water is a bent molecule, whereas carbon dioxide is a straight molecule. The reason carbon dioxide is straight just has to do with the way the electrons are shared. In water, there's extra electrons on the top which push these down, but in the carbon case, everything is bonded and there are no extra electrons pushing on anything, so it becomes a straight molecule. But notice that we have these two two curved rods here. This indicates that there's two electrons being shared, whereas this is a single pair of electrons being shared, this is a pair of electrons, and this is another pair of electrons which are being shared. So this is called a double bond in chemistry, whereas the other is called a single bond. So it's a straight molecule, that's number one difference. Number two, it's double bonded. Now because of that, remember, the oxygens are very electronegative. They can pull electrons very, very very efficiently. That's why everything gets oxidized on Earth because oxygen's really good at reacting and pulling electrons in. So these electrons, even though they're shared, they're pulled more towards the oxygen. These electrons which are shared, they're pulled away from the carbon towards the oxygen. So the oxygen is very slightly negative on this molecule and the carbon is very slightly positive in the center. Right, So we have negative on the outside of the molecule and positive on the inside. But don't forget that these are electron clouds, whereas Hydrogen has a very small electron cloud, so when a, an electron's kind of pulled away from it, the, it's almost like the hydrogen's bare. But these 
these electron clouds are much larger because carbon has more electrons, more protons. The atom is larger. So it's like a big cloud hanging around here. So the bottom line is this electron cloud is very slightly negative. This electron cloud is very slightly negative. This one's very slightly positive, but it's buried between two giant negative clouds. So it's hard to see the positive charge on the inside. Compare that to this molecule where the oxygen was very exposed. It was very easy to see for, uh, for neighboring water molecules to see the, the net charge on this oxygen here. Whereas here, it's very hard to kind of see the positive that's really in there because it's buried in between two very large electronegative atoms. So what that means is when carbon dioxide molecule bounces up against another carbon dioxide molecule, what's really going to happen is the negative uh, oxygen is going to see a negative oxygen on the other uh, carbon dioxide molecule and it's going to repel because light charges repel. So whereas the water molecules tended to be sticky and attract because opposites attracted what we talked about a minute ago, when the carbon dioxides bump against each other, more than likely we're going to have two negatives bouncing into each other and they're going to violently repel each other. Yes, it's positive, possible to see the positive charge on the inside, but it's going to be hard because it's nestled in between these atoms. It's going to be hard to get in there and see and feel that charge. So when we have dry ice in the solid state, this is locked into a lattice, trillions of them in a repeating lattice. As soon as you add a little bit of energy, one of them gets dislodged. But instead of like the water entering the liquid phase where it is flowing around each other and being sticky and attracting adjacent water molecules, that's what we call a liquid. What happens here, as soon as it exits the solid, then what happens is one molecule's negative uh, oxygen will see another negative's oxygen and they'll violently repel. So they go shooting off into the gas phase and they never enter the liquid state. So the reason why carbon dioxide sublimates, the reason why it goes directly from solid directly to gas instead of a liquid phase, is because the molecule is straight and it's flanked with negative charges on the outside of the molecule. So as soon as it gets enough energy to be dislodged from the solid state, then what happens is it immediately encounters another molecule, it repels, and then it's just being, it's being kicked out of, the, out of the lattice and it goes into the vapor phase because it's not attractive at all. It's repulsive. Whereas with the water molecules, because it was bent with that exposed oxygen there and opposites attracted, there was a lot of intermolecular attraction happening. That's what we call a flowy liquid, like, like liquid water. The carbon dioxide does not enter the liquid phase because of the repulsion between the molecules. Now, we see that we can make it enter a liquid phase, but the way to do it is to put a lot of external pressure on it. Why do you think that does anything? Because if I put a lot of external pressure, then when it gets dislodged from the solid state, the solid dry ice, then it wants to be repelled and, and be pushed out as a vapor, but it's being met with resistance by the increased outside pressure. So when we increase the pressure on the outside, we can force it to stay in a liquid phase, even though the repulsion's happening by physically forcing it with outside vapor pressure. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you learned something, found it entertaining and informative. If you like more of videos like this, please drop me a line, let me know. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.